this week that this is what the, program, the recovery part of the program is all about. It's broken into three parts. The problem, the solution, and the program of action. Okay? Um, and somebody was asking me about the, the word malady on page 64 that we went over. Um, it says, when the spiritual malady is overcome, it says they looked up the word malady, and one of the definitions is disease. And they're correct. But also, one of the definitions for the word malady is sickness. Sick. And actually, the root origin of the word malady is, is a French word, malade, which means sick. So, um, it's, it's not the only definition. So, again, we're talking about, and I don't deny that we're spiritually sick. My point is, it's not a part of the disease. AA doesn't talk about it um, in any of their pamphlets or any of their literature. And, and so, but we do talk about the twofold disease, mind and body, mental and spiritual, okay? So, um, and, and my biggest thing is, with, with, with that, is because a lot of people believe it to be a threefold disease, but uh, my biggest thing is, if, if if I had a disease, if, if the God in me was so small that he could be sickened with a disease, then I have the wrong God in my life. So that's just my take on, on the whole thing. That my guy can't get a disease or can't get sick or anything like that. So hi guys. Sorry it took so long to get on. All right. All right. And then the other thing I forgot what somebody the other thing was that somebody was asking. Oh, they were talking about, I, I mentioned at the beginning, the, the caveman getting sick, and they wanted to know what my point was. And, I, you know, sometimes, and as the older I get, the more my mind wanders, you know. Uh, so I might start talking about something and get another thought and start talking about something else. So I don't know if I ever expanded on that, but what, what, my point with that was that, and, and I think it's, a, it, it's an important point, that alcoholics have never defined ourselves. Society and the rest of the world since way back thousands of years have defined an alcoholic rather than us. You know, we're sick people, we're weak, um, uh, we need to be in, you know, locked up or, you know, and there was some, there was some parts of time not long ago where they put us in a padded room, you know. Um, and they tried all kinds of things. So, but, but the point is that <clears throat> other people and society has defined who we are. And it wasn't until Bill Wilson and, and Dr. Bob got together and, and put this program together that two alcoholics de defined who we are. And since then, millions of people have recovered. So I think that's pretty cool that, you know, once we start defining who we are ourselves, it makes more sense. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Okay. So anybody got any questions? Don't be afraid to ask a question. You know, as we're going along, uh, don't save it for like two days after this. we do this and then nobody else knows we're being here. All right. Hi, guys. How are you? Okay. So, Cabot, is that you, Cabot? Yeah. That's you on Okay. All right, so let's go. We didn't. We left off at forward to the second edition. And if you notice that this forward was came out in 1955. And if you just flip back a couple pages that, and you look at the uh, forward to the first edition, you'll see that it came out in 1959. <coughs> And if you shoot forward to the third edition, you'll see it came out in 1976, I believe. And so, in, in 1955, it says that uh, we're 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly helpful state of mind and body. And in 1955, the interesting thing says in, in 1955 is that um, uh, 16 years, second paragraph, 16 years 
uh, have elapsed between our first printing of this book and the presentation and the presentation 1955 of our second edition. In that brief span, Alcoholics Anonymous has mushroomed into nearly 6,000 groups whose membership is far above 150,000 recovered alcoholics. So in 1939, we had 100 men and women, and in 1955, we have 150,000, over 150,000. And in 1976, um, we had, uh, it says, estimated more than a million, and I'm not even sure, I don't think I've ever even looked at the fourth edition. Fourth edition, it says uh, two million. So, and, uh, but, so if you can see 100 men and women, 150,000 men and women, um, over a million, over two million. That tells you that this program works, doesn't it? That there's something here that's happening that works. And you can't deny that because the, the facts are right here. And, and from, from how much it has grown. Okay, so that's an important point. And then on the first page of the uh, second edition, it just talks about you know, how they're all over the world now, and it goes on and on. And, uh, and then there's a lot of stuff in the second edition, uh, forward to the second edition, that refers to the traditions, okay? And we're not really gonna go over that stuff because like I said, we're gonna stick with the recovery part of the program. Um, and but here, here's something interesting. If you go over to um, Roman numeral 20, I'm still in forward to the second edition. Uh, and it talks in the middle of that top paragraph there. It says, um, AA grew by leaps and bounds. For this, there were two principal reasons. The large numbers of recoveries and reunited homes. These made their impressions everywhere. Of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried, 50% got sober at once and remained that way. 25% sobered up after some relapses, and among the remainder, those who stayed on with AA showed improvement. So now, this is a statistic from 1955. And if you look closely at this stati statistic, it's telling us that in 1955, 75% of the people that came into AA and really tried got sober and stayed that way. Some after some relapses, 50% of them at once. And by the way, I'm 150%. Um, and I was a straight up drunk and a straight up drug me. Um, and I got sober and have been sober since day one. So I know that 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 this really works. But the book is saying that 50% and then 25 after some relapse. So 75% of the people who came to AA in, that, in those days got sober and stayed sober. Now it's 1955. Do you know what the national statistic is today, in 2020? I don't know what the one. I might tell you last week, so when I start talking about numbers, sometimes I start bullshitting. <laughs> I don't know what the number is in 2020. In fact, the last time I knew what the number was, it was probably about 2010. Uh, but but there's, there's things that you can look up and find. Back in 2010, it was 15% nationwide. So anything besides that is just me bullshit, because I don't know. But, so let's work with that figure. 15% of the people trying to get sober get sober. Um, so the question then, what has happened? There you go. What has happened since 1955 to 2000 or today's time? that the percentage of people getting sober has gone from 75% to 15%. That's a big difference. That's a lot. That's a huge difference, isn't it? And it's an interesting fact. In 1956, the AMA, the American Medical Association, declared alcoholism a disease. So now, what that means is anytime the AMA declares something a disease, hospitals have to treat it. They have to, because it's a disease. So in 1956, hospitals started opening up wings to
to treat alcoholism. And these are really kind people that loved us and really wanted to help. But they just didn't get it. They just didn't understand. So, uh, and since that day, there's been periods in our history here, and, and uh, you know, going back from 1956 to today, that this country has gone through phases where tons of treatment centers open and hospitals open and private, you know, it goes, it goes up and down. It depends how much money they could come up with and what the government's putting into it and private sector and all that. But there's been lots of ups and downs in how many places. And all of these people in these places are real kind people that really want to help people like us. And, you know, if you go to any treatment facility today, if you're doing H&I work and you, you carry the message to these places, and you go there and you'll notice what the, what the clients are getting. They get a stack of papers like this, and, and if you go to treatment, they say, here, here's your first step. Do your first step. And they get a stack of papers like this. Here's your second step. Do your second step. Uh, and, uh, you know, little by little, what's happened since 1956 to today is that we've gotten so far away from the clear-cut, precise, specific directions that are in the big book that we've wound up with a 15% national average of people getting sober. Because we've gotten away from the basic work that the book tells you to do. Up until then, in 1955, they didn't have all those luxury places that you can go to get sober. You know, you uh, just dried out somewhere and, and, that, and then you've got busy working uh, AA program. And their statistics were 75%. But, you know, let kind people try to help us and, you know, we get so far off of our program that, and, you know, today we were talking, I mean, Justin was talking before the meeting and, and what I said to him is when the new people come in here, it's not their fault that they don't know anything about this program, you can't blame a newcomer. How are they supposed to know? We don't know what we don't know. It's our fault that we're not teaching them what this book is about and getting them to understand the disease kind, of, getting them to understand what this is about. What is the problem? You know, what is the problem? I asked somebody last week, uh, you know, why are they powerless over alcohol, whatever it is, and, you know, again, the answers are always the same. I can't control it, it controls me, I lose control. In some form or other, those are the answers. And what I said to you guys last week was that your loss of control, your lack of control, and your inability to control is not why you're powerless. Those are results of being powerless. And so I can ask, I can ask people, you know, <coughs> Stephen. Stephen, I'm sorry. Stephen, what is the first step in recovery? Uh, admitting your problem. Okay, you want to help him out? What's the first step in recovery? Do you know? Uh. He's whispering to you. You want to know what is it? Oh, that, that our lives have become unmanageable. Our lives have become unmanageable. That's the first step in recovery. Just that? And that you're powerless. And that we're powerless. Well, you got it backwards, but so we're powerless and, and, okay, two things. So you got that on page 58 in the book. Okay. So important, let me get, I don't want to get off track and lose where I was, but it, the, the step says we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. There's a dash in there. Dash that our lives have become unmanageable. It does not say we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives are unmanageable. And if you're familiar with the English language, when you see a dash in there, it's the same sentence, that, that, but it's a completely different thought. It's a completely different concept, all in the same sentence. If it said and, then it would insinuate <coughs> that my unmanageability is a result of my powerlessness. And that's not true. Because I've been sober a long time and my life is still unmanageable. Unless I get up in the morning and hook up with God. Left to my own devices, my life is still unmanageable. <coughs> so 
So it's important that we understand that. There's no and in that first step. But, so we admitted we were powerless. You read that on page 58 just now. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol dash that our lives would become unmanageable. So that would be the first step in recovery, right? No, it's not. That would be the first of the 12 steps. So there's, this, there's the first step in recovery comes way before that that you've probably read thousands of times and never paid any attention to it. There's a step before the steps. And if you just quickly turn to page 30 in your book, you'll see the second paragraph on page 30 says, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. So here's the problem that we face today in Alcoholics Anonymous and all the other 12-step programs. Somebody gets, tries to get sober, they come into the rooms, and they ask somebody to sponsor them, and the sponsor says to them, are you powerless over alcohol? And they go, yeah. Is your life unmanageable? Oh, yeah. Okay, you believe in God? I don't know. Are you willing to believe in God? I guess. Uh, okay. You ready to make a decision to tell you willing to life on God? I guess so. <laughs> All right, let's write a fourth step. And they've done absolutely nothing about what the problem is. They've done absolutely nothing about what the solution is. And they've, gone, they've skipped all that and gone right to the program of action. So they, they, that is a huge problem. And that is the fault of the sponsor. Again, it's not the newcomer's fault. It can't be the newcomer's fault. Now... This is important, what I'm going to say to you. On page 58, the first of the 12 steps, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, dash, that our lives had become unmanageable. Probably 95% of him, I am going making up numbers again. I can't help myself when it comes to that shit. I don't have a real figure. I don't know. I'm going to say 90%. I'm sticking with that. That's my, my answer. I'm sticking with it. Did you say 95? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, it probably is 95. Right? <laughs> it might even be more. My point is, my point is, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, it's a bad habit. My point is this, is so many people come in the rooms of recovery, and all, of they, all that they do is they acknowledge that what it says on page 58. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, dash that our lives had become unmanageable. Acknowledging that is not taking the first step. They've already 20 something pages and 28 pages past the thing that tells you what you have to do before you get there. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. Now, let's look at that sentence for a minute. We learn, means we didn't know. So we have to come in here and we have to learn it, right? We have to learn what? We have to learn that we have, that we have to fully concede to our innermost self that we were alcoholic. After we spend weeks and weeks in here, we're going to go back to that paragraph and we're going to see that that is really the directions on how to work the first step. And we'll, we'll do that together in here, but not tonight. Why not tonight? Because then I would be the sponsor that's not helping you understand what the problem is. I'd be the person that's taking you right to the solution and the program of action. So we need to spend plenty of time understanding what the problem is first. And we will go back to page 30, the second paragraph, and we will take that direction. But what I want you to understand is that just because you agree or acknowledge the fact that we're powerless over alcohol, dash, that our lives have 
become unmanageable does not mean you've taken a first step. I could have done that when I was laid out flat on my back after drinking too much. You powerless there? Yeah, I'm powerless. Is your life a matter? I, <laughs> I can admit that anytime. So it, it, what they're asking us on page 58 is to be able to admit it at a depth and level that it really means something. At a depth and level that I really understand it. And that's where we got to get to. Now, you can't do it when you first come in because you don't know anything. It's like I, I jokingly shared last week about the guy that comes in and got his job back and his, his partner let them back in the house and, you know, this program's great and next week he's going to have 30 days. You don't have to understand this program. He has no understanding about this program. Uh, so, and, and that's what it is here. I, a newcomer cannot do that. So when you, get a, when you get a newbie and you sit down and work with him and you try to pound into the fact to, to him to admit that he's powerless and his life is unmanageable, you're wasting your friggin' time. Because if they weren't powerless and their life wasn't in my, in my life, they wouldn't have came here. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, my life is great, I'm going to join AA. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Right? It makes no sense. Why would somebody come here if everything was great? There's no great secret. When somebody walks in the door, guess what? We know. Their life is shit. They may not know it yet. Sometimes the judge sends them, or the old lady, or the old man sends them, somebody else sends them, and they want to get the heat off of them, and they come. But most people deep down know their life's a mess. So, so it's our job to help them understand what the problem is. Okay? And that takes a little bit of time, and it takes going through all the work. So we don't take a newcomer and sit him down and make him tell us that they're powerless and their life is a matter. It's a waste of time. Does that make any sense to you? Because they don't understand why they're powerless. I knew on my way to treatment that I was powerless and that my life was unmanageable. So if that was the real case, then I probably didn't need to go to treatment. I probably could have turned around and just not drank anymore. No, it ain't going to happen. So, all right. So let's go back. So um, we were talking about the forward to the second edition, right? <coughs> And we're on Roman numeral 20. Danny, you got the third edition. Uh, well, this is not my book. This I took from here. <coughs> I have a study book, and it doesn't have, it only has the fourth to the first edition in it. So this one has the fourth edition. But I got sober with the second edition. And, uh, Though the third edition was out but, uh, when I got sober, but everybody was still using the second edition. So anyway, um, and it just talks, and if you go on to the third, third edition, and, and it, it just, it's real quick. It, they don't have much to add, and neither do they in the fourth edition, okay? So has anybody got any questions on the forwards? I think the message on the forwards is, is, is in the first edition, and the message is also on how many people have recovered in the span of time. Uh, so if nobody has any questions, let's go on to the doctor's opinion. Okay, I have that in mind. So as we read the doctor's opinion, I want you to pay attention to, to the wording that the doctor uses. When he's talking about this disease, he uses the word, and he chooses to use this word, it's not by coincidence, he uses the word allergy more than once, rather than the word addiction. He does talk about that the addiction that's one of the places that he worked in, addiction to alcohol, but 
when the doctor is describing alcoholism, he uses the word allergy. And it's a very interesting point that he does that. Do you know the difference? Any of the new people sitting to this for the first time, does anybody know the difference between an allergy and an addiction? So, um, an addiction, if you have an addiction to something, like say you have an addiction to nicotine, right? Uh, you smoke a cigarette and you appease the addiction. So what happens is you temporarily lessen the desire for more with an addiction. If anybody's ever known a, a heroin addict, right? They, they take a shot of dope and they temporarily lessen the desire for another shot of dope until their body starts getting sick and they need more, right? Or an opiate addict or, or anybody that has an addiction, right? Unless you're drinking and doing drugs, you, you have, if you have an addiction to, to nicotine, you smoke a cigarette, you're good for a little bit. You know, back-to-back -back cigarettes, right? Um, because you have appeased the, the uh, addiction. So that's what happens if you have an addiction. And the doctor uses the word allergy because the allergy is quite the opposite. The, uh, with an allergy, does anybody here, uh, I have bad um, hay fever. And my eyes get so bad and my nose that I want to take a fork and scratch my eyeballs. It's, it's that bad, you know. Uh, um, and some people are allergic to different foods or something. And, um, and, and, and usually what, what happens when you're allergic to something uh, or, you, uh, or with my allergy, um, you, maybe you break out in a rash or a hives, right? If you eat some food that you're allergic to, or in my case, or either way though, when I when my allergies start bothering me, I try my hardest to not touch my eyes because I know what's going to happen. If I do, I'm not going to be able to stop. Because what happens is once I appease the allergy, it greatens the desire for more. If you have a rash and you scratch it, it greatens the desire to be scratched. Okay? If, if I rub my eyes when my allergies bother me, I can't stop it. It greatens the desire for more. That's what an allergy does, quite the opposite of, of an addiction. So the doctor uses this word allergy for talking about us because it, it works perfectly. When we appease the allergy, it greatens the desire for more. When we take a drink, and by the way, there's a process that goes on. It's kind of a three-step process. And it goes like this. I take a drink. I set the allergy off. The phenomenon of, cra of craving develops, and I want more. Now, there's sometimes I take a drink and I don't set the allergy off. And the phenomenon of craving does not come into play. Sometimes people that are allergic to strawberries say they can eat a strawberry and not break out in hives. Sometimes I'm subjected to pollen and I don't have a reaction. That's an allergy. An allergy doesn't always 100% of the time get you. <clears throat> now with alcoholism, the further you are advanced in your disease, the more likely it is it's going to get you. But there are periods of times where uh, an alcoholic or a potential alcoholic can take a drink and not ignite the allergy. So it's not correct to say that an alcoholic would take a drink and the phenomenon of craving develops. That is not correct statement. The correct statement is that the alcoholic takes a drink, ignites the allergy, and the manifestation of that allergy is the phenomenon of craving. But sometimes the allergy is not ignited. There's an old saying in AA that uh, a man takes a drink, the drink takes a drink, the drink takes a man. 
The man takes a drink, the drink takes the drink, a drink, and the drink takes the man or the woman. Okay? And that's so true because that's what happens for us. So what happens is here, um, and that's why this disease that we have is cunning, baffling, and powerful. Because I, I, I'll believe that my willpower has not allowed me to, to stay out drinking for three days. That I stopped and I was able to. When the true fact is, I might not have set the allergy off that time. And there's a part in the book that Bill's talking about, and you're probably familiar with it, where he says, he gives us a test, right? We'll read it when we get to it, but the, the, if Bill gives us a test. He says, go to the nearest bar and try drinking. And, and if you notice what he says next in that test, try it a few times. Or try it more than once, whatever he says. I'm paraphrasing, but... Uh, but the reason he tells you that is because he knows you could get away with it maybe once or twice. But he knows if you try it a few times, you're going to be screwed. Because it's not a matter of luck. Actually, let's go over something real quick here. Go to the bottom of page, uh, Roman numeral 27, XXVII. Well, I don't know if that's the same in your book. That's, I'm marking it. That, um, let me see. Let me tell you like this. One, two, three, four. The fifth page of the doctor's opinion. And on the bottom of that page, it says, I do not hold with those. Do you see that? Is everybody there? I do not hold with those. I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is entirely a problem of mental control. I have met, had many men who had, for example, worked a period of months on some problem or business deal, which was to be settled on a certain date favorable to them. They took a drink a day or so prior to the date, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important appointment was not met. <coughs> These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. That's a very important statement there because what it's saying to me is that it's like let's use the analogy of, of being allergic to strawberries, okay? So if I have an allergy to strawberries and I eat a bunch of strawberries, right? And, and just, just stuff my face with these strawberries. You know, once I do that, it doesn't matter how much I pray, or how much I wish, or how much willpower I muster up that I don't break out in, in, in rashes. It doesn't matter. Because at that point, it's, it's a matter beyond my mental control. It becomes a physical problem. You follow me? So here he says, these men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. A craving beyond their mental control. Once you take a drink, it doesn't matter how much you wish, how much you pray, or how much willpower you can muster up. It is no longer a mental issue. It is now a problem of the phys physical. You get that? These men were not drinking to escape, they were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. Now that's what we're dealing with. And I'm sure you all have experienced that before in your own personal life. Why, you know, why? I mean, I don't know how many times I've, I'm driving, I'm on my way home, and I just thought, let me just stop for a minute here. I know they miss me in there. <laughs> Let me just say hello. You know. And literally, three days later, I, I come, you know, dragging my ass out of there. Put my head down, and I get home, and it's always the same crazy situation. Me walking in the house, broke, busted, and disgusted, and six-handed, so. Right? 
And that's the way it is time after time. And I don't know what happens, but there's something about it that doesn't allow me to think, uh, to think correctly. But once I start, you know, these men, and, and if you look at the next paragraph after that, these men were not drinking to overcome, uh, to escape, they were bringing to overcome a craving behind them. Look what it says next. There are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. The supreme sacrifice. Not, if you not understand what that means, that means kill themselves. That's suicide. Not some people. There's been thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people over the years that have taken the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. That's what we're dealing with. That's the kind of disease that we're dealing with. Okay. So, um, all right. So we're back at the doctor's opinion. And let's go to the second page of the doctor's opinion. And I told you last week, every time we come across something in the book, you should make a little note or a little nut something that talks about the mind and the body, the mental and the physical. And you're going to be amazed by the time you're done with this book how many times it talks about mind and body, mental and physical. There's all 100, 150, something like that. Uh, the physician who at our request gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement he confirms what we who have <coughs> suffered alcoholic torture must believe, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. And this here is way ahead of its time. This is in the mid-1930s that the doctor is making this statement. And I shared with you last week that, um, you know, uh, in here, when they talk about uh, it's a progressive disease, it always gets worse, never gets better, right? That the, these, that statement and this statement here, you got to understand how powerful a statement this is, that they stamped their name on this statement. And it wasn't until 1976 that this stuff was medically proven. And I'll tell you that story when we get to it in, uh, a little bit in the book. But in 1976, this was medically proven, <coughs> what they're talking about right here. That they talked about in 1936 and 37 and put in print in 1939. It's amazing. That the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality or were outright mental def defectors. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent for some of us. Some of you right here in this room. <laughs> but we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. So he says, the doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As lame in our opinion to his soundness may, of course, mean little, but as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. So once they understood what it was to have an allergy, you know, and, and this allergy is not like any other allergy in the world, because this allergy is twofold. My first wife was allergic to shellfish. And us Italians, on Christmas Eve, as many of you know, many of you have been to my house, and if you haven't, you're all welcome next Christmas. We always do a huge, it's called the Italian people, we have a feast of the seven seas, and it's a shellfish and all kinds of fish feast every Christmas Eve. So my first wife was allergic to shellfish. But every Christmas Eve, she couldn't help herself. She would be eating scongeal. And, and all kinds of stuff, all shellfish, you know. And the next day, Christmas Day every year, her lips would be all... <laughs> She'd be like a puffer fish. You know? And everybody in the family would make fun of her. But she didn't care, because she, she, she knew it was going to happen, she didn't care. Once a year, she'd be like that. It must be pretty hot sitting there with all that delicious food in front of you, you can't eat that. So, but my point is, 
the difference between our allergy and the allergy she had or anybody else has is ours is twofold. Because all year long, she wouldn't eat shellfish as much as she loved it. She didn't have a mind telling her, no, you can eat a little bit. <laughs> Just have a clam or two. <laughs> you can see a little bit, have a half a lobster. You know what I mean? She didn't have that struggle. And neither do people that have allergies of chocolate or strawberry or something else, whatever they have. They don't have their mind convincing them they could do what they already know damn well that they can't do. That's the dangerous part of alcoholism. We have a mind that tells me I can do what I already swore I never, I'm never going to do again. With every fiber of my being, I don't want to do. You know, when I ask people why they're powerless, and they start telling me what happens after they drink, they've missed the point. You know, why powerless of alcohol? It controls me. I lost, I lose control. I can't control it. We know that. That's not why you're powerless. Again, those are results of being powerless. So when I ask you why you're powerless and you tell me what happens after you take the drink, you've missed the point. And it's an important point that you should not miss. Your life may depend on it. Or somebody's life down the road that you may be helping might depend on it. It's, that's not it. And I'm not going to tell you why you're powerless, because those of you who are doing this for the first time, you'll, you'll learn it in here. And that's what the newcomer needs. He needs to learn why he's powerless. But what the point is, my point is that it, if you start telling me what happens after you drink, you're completely off track. I want to know why. When two days ago you looked in the mirror and you swore with every fiber of your being that you were never going to do it again, and you swore to God, and you prayed for help, and you looked at yourself in the mirror and you said, I swear I'm never going to do this again. And a day later you're doing it again. When you do what you swear you're never going to do, when you do what you don't want to do with every fiber of your being, damn it, that's powerless. And why? Why? That's what we need to get them to understand. Not what happens after I drink. That's a powerless on a whole different level. We can all agree with that. All bets are off. You know, the old AA joke is, uh, uh, I'm allergic to alcohol. When I drink it, I break out in spots. Miami, Vegas, St. Louis, <laughs> wherever, who knows, you know. We all can agree, everybody in this room right now can agree to one thing, that once we start drinking, all bets are off, we don't know what's going to happen. And for those of you that, other than alcohol is your thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what drug of no choice you, you, you use. The end result, the end result of drinking and using is we wind up alone and hurting We don't want to do it no more. And yet we go on, some of us for years, some of us for the rest of our lives, in a miserable existence, miserable existence, proving every day how powerless I am, proving every day the unmanageability in my life. Okay. So the doctor says, but well, we are sure that our bodies were sick and in, in our belief, any picture of the alcoholics which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. So Dr. Dr. Silkward made it, he stepped way out here. He stepped way out and he said that not only is there something wrong with us mentally, but our bodies got a problem. We are allergic to alcohol. Okay. Then at the bottom of the page, so we work on our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane. 
Does anybody, raise your hand if you do not know what the word altruistic means. Okay, you're allowed to go outside of AA and use a non-approved book called Webster's Dictionary. And anytime you come to a word in the big book that you don't know what it means, spend the five minutes to look it up. Google it. There you go. Google it. I'm a dinosaur. What? What's a dictionary? <laughs> What's a dictionary? <laughs> Who's Webster, right? <laughs> oh, God, I've been doing this for too long. We didn't have Google when I started doing this. Um, but seriously, spend a few minutes and look up words. I actually know a gentleman that learned how to read by studying the big book of alcoholics. No. I used to have, Kelly, if you remember, I used to have a set of uh, a tapes, that, the big book and the 12 and 12, and I used to give them to people, and all it was was somebody reading every word in the book, because some people couldn't read, or they couldn't read very well, so the book would be read to them, and it was on tape. And they still have those tapes available, they're probably now on a CD or something, they had a big old box of tapes that they were in. Um, I used to give them to people that had problem reading. they sit there and they'd let the tape read to them the big book and the 12 and 12. And, and so, you know, not only will you learn about what's the matter with you and, and how you can change your life, but you, you might learn a few things other than that. Okay, so, um, so altruistic. I'm going to ask you guys, I hope I remember next week, I'm going to ask you guys what that means. If that word is used twice, in the, in the next few pages it's used again. And you can look up the word altruism. That's where it comes from. Okay? And uh, next week you'll tell me what that means. Okay. So we'll go to the next page in the doctor's opinion, right? And then the doctor's uh, telling the story here. And, uh, and he says, it's a few paragraphs down, he says, we, we doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics. But its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. So moral psychology, you know, just truthful talking one alcoholic to another. An honest talk between two drunks. That's really what they're talking about there. And look what he says here, down towards the end, it says, uh, uh, many years ago, one of the leading contributors to this book came under our care in the hospital, and while here, he acquired some ideas that he put into practical application at once. Later, he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here, and with some misgivings, we consented. Now, that is an understatement of the century, with some misgivings. Just think about this. We're talking about 1935 or 34, and Bill leaving Towns Hospital and coming back and telling Dr. Silkworth, you know, that he's sober and things are great and I'd like to go talk to the patients upstairs. And Dr. Silkworth having to go back and sit down with the other doctors who their treatment for people alcoholics in those days were to put you in a straitjacket in a padded room and try all kinds of things on you until you, you know, some people would die from the withdrawal. Can you imagine today? Go to any hospital here today or any big treatment facility and go see the head doctor and say, I'd like to go upstairs and talk to your patients. <laughs> Now they do that, they do that, they allow that today in H&I, hospital institution committees, they allow the people to come in and do that. But, of course, there were none then. But, it, it, you know, you just laughed when I said, go to a hospital here and ask the doctor, and you laugh. And this is 2020. So he said, with some misgiving, we let him go up and talk to, to the people. He had to put up some fight, I bet you, in the, in, the, in the meeting with the other doctors to have a patient come back and go up and talk to the patients. I, 
I would have liked to have heard that story. So, then he says, the unselfishness of these men as we've come to know, the entire absence of profit motive and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who's laid long and wearily in alcohol field. And those of you that are going to look up the word altruism, you, we, we've just given you the definition of it, but look it up anyway. They believe in themselves and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. And then he talks about maybe going to the hospital and getting detoxing or something first. And he says, we believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. That the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drink. Now, what he's saying here is very important. The action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is the manifestation of an allergy. So what he's telling you here is that the allergy is a, the, the manifestation of this allergy is a physical reaction. It's a physical reaction. And that's important because we say things that ain't right all the time. You get a you get a, a newcomer, maybe 30, 45 days, 60 days, and you're talking to them, and they're, how you feeling? I'm, I'm craving a drink real bad. No, you're not. You're not craving a drink real bad. No, yeah, yeah. No, they're obsessing on a drink real bad. I don't give a shit what you call it. I want a drink, right? That's, you know, they don't want to care about the particulars, but again, it's your job to teach them. So somebody with 40 days, 30 days, 3 weeks, 60 days is not craving a drink. Because the craving is a physical reaction. It's the manifestation of an allergy. It's the, it's the way that manifestation is a big word. It just means that's the way it works itself out. Okay? So the, the, if you're allergic to strawberries and you eat strawberries, or if you're like my first wife and you eat the shellfish, the manifestation that's going to get all puffy lips and like a blowfish, right? That's the way it works itself out for her. So the manifestation of the is a physical reaction. Now, again, the newcomer may say, I don't give a shit what you call it, I want to drink real bad. But you know why it's important that you teach them that? Because one is of the mind and one is of the body. Remember we talked about the people that were not drinking to escape, they were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. That's the body. That's the physical. When I say, when a newcomer or somebody says, I'm craving a drink real bad, no you're not, you gotta let them understand, that's, that situation is of the mind. It is not a physical thing going on. Now it may be powerful, I'm not minimizing how powerful a, you know, an obsession can be. It can be really powerful. But nevertheless, you have the ability to change your mind. You do it 30 times a day. I'm going to wear these pants, and I'm going to wear that pants. I'm going to go here for lunch, and I'm going to go there for lunch. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Granted, changing your mind when it comes to a drink or a drug is not as easy because we really want what we want, don't we? But it's the same concept. It's just a matter of changing your mind. You actually have the power to change your mind when it comes to a drink, just like you have the power to change your mind what kind of pants you're going to wear today. No different, except for you obsess too much on drink. But the concept is the same. It's just a matter of changing your mind. I used to mess with people all the time, and I respond to them. They say, I, 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 want to, I want to get fucked up. I go get fucked up. Yeah. What are you telling me for? I ain't the dope man. I ain't the bartender. Well, you're supposed to stop me. No, I'm not. <laughs> Where'd you read that? <laughs> well, what am I supposed to do? I'm here to help you when you tell me you need help because you don't want to do what you want to do. 
But if you're telling me that you don't, if you're not telling me you don't want to do it, you just tell me you want to do it, then go ahead and do it. Because you know, one thing that we have to understand is, and alcohol is synonymous is not anti-alcohol, and neither are we. We don't take up the flag and march against alcohol and all that. If you want to drink, go right ahead. I'm not here to stop you from drinking. But if you ask me for help, that you don't want to do what you want to do, that's what I'm here for. That's what we're all here for. All right. So somebody remember where we left off. We'll leave off on that point. Time is up. It goes so fast when you're having fun. I know. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All these people watching. Thank you. And don't forget, the, you now can watch it on YouTube. Probably by Saturday, it'll be up on YouTube. And thank you, Scott. That's a great job you did with the YouTube. Thank you, guys.